Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, and we're glad to have you here. This is a call-in live talk show, and we're glad to have you watching, uh, so feel free to call in. If you don't want to do that, there's the website there below, um, uh, or the email address, I should say, to call in with questions or comments or suggestions for the show. Also, if you want to see past shows, there's uh, YouTube.com, Speechless, Backsplash, Backsplash, Speechless MN. So we're glad to have you here today. Uh, going to update you on a few things, but the main theme is about domestic violence and how it works throughout our society, whether it's abortion. Uh, we're going to go through some clips on um, the U.S. Senate hearing in the House Judiciary Committee on uh, Women, Guns, and Violence, and just see some clips from that to give a perspective there. And then we're going to tie it into Robin Williams' um, suicide and just put a proper perspective because some of this, uh, you're going to see a dichotomy between Planned Parenthood and how they promote and how they promote uh, abuse of women uh, to our young girls and of course our schools are now starting to do this so there's just this disconnect between Planned Parenthood our school system and the domestic violence industry it's uh, quite alarming but it's there and it's strong and it's a it's a mixed message that actually ends up uh, I think creating more violence uh, because there isn't unity in this and because it's all about money and not about women's uh, rights. It's about money and power. Uh, so that's pretty much what the show's going to be on. But before we get into that, um, Michelle McDonald, who's running for the U.S. Supreme Court, the Pioneer Press said uh, she got a ticket. And uh, she was pulled over, as, as my understanding of what they read, by a police officer uh, going to St. Cloud and to or from, I don't know which, doesn't matter, got pulled over. And then she got ticketed for exceeding her driving uh, limits, her revocation. Not revocations, but restrictions. <clears throat> and so I read that, read that, and I go, wow, there's something's not right here, <laughs> okay? Uh, this doesn't sound part of the process. But you have to know a few of the pieces, which the papers, they could have called Michelle McDonald. They didn't. And actually in the process, we found out what a lot of times the paper do, paper, what they do, they go down to the courts where you have access to the case files and the records, and they uh, look at what's happening. You can pull up a screen. You can do it from home pull up a screen and see the records, but you got to go down to Hennepin County or, or Ramsey County or the Minnesota Judicial Center, which is where the Supreme Court and appellate courts meet. You have to go down there in order to find actual, to look up the documents um, or to the particular county that the uh, event took in. But in order to print out a copy, it's uh, 10 bucks uh, a, a copy, uh, a section, and so Instead of doing that, they just take a picture of the screen. Uh, and, and anyway, they, they just go buy off the information on the screen and uh, avoid the 10 bucks. And of course, pictures aren't allowed anywhere around courtrooms, cameras, supposedly. So there's kind of a dichotomy that goes on there. Um, but here's what happened, okay? You know, you, we've talked about Michelle McDonald being charged with a DUI which uh, those that have done the research, looked at the facts, say this is false and very strongly be, believe she'll be acquitted of that. Um, but with that DUI in which she was never offered a breathalyzer, which she was refused to go to when she asked to go before a judge, which the law uh, requires if you ask to go before a judge, you get to go right away. Uh, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you get to go right away. And I tell you what, if you think you're innocent, you're going you're gonna to do that. If you think you're being railroaded by the police, you're going to do that. 
But if you're guilty and you know you're drunk, you're not going to wake a judge up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You just won't do it. Even if you're drunk, <laughs> I don't believe you'd do that. But she has to go do that, and they refuse to let her go before the judge. They wouldn't let her do it. Um, and once she was finally released without charges, she went uh, and got a blood test and came up 00.00. .00. Uh, so a lot of procedural, a lot of technical uh, issues were not done uh, and, and were done improperly by the uh, police officers involved in this. And, but either way, according to the law, if you refuse to take a breathalyzer, if you refuse to take a test, if a breathalyzer, which none was offered, by law you're automatically charged with a DUI. And <clears throat> Uh, get restrictions placed on your license until your court date. Uh, but one of those restrictions is you can't drive unless you're going to work, back and forth to work, and she works, has an office in St. Cloud. So uh, instead of being pulled over by a police officer, she noticed her car having problems. It was, uh, something was happening to it, I believe overheating. And uh, pulled over, saw a police officer on the side of the road assisting or ticketing somebody else, pulled over and said, hey, uh, I need help here. And the police officer uh, basically, once he was done doing with the ticket or assistance of the other person on the highway, just took off. And so she flagged down another police officer. The other police officer uh, assisted Michelle and with what she needed and then said I, I need to ticket you uh, because you're exceeding your restriction and of course the uh, officer didn't find any exculpatory evidence meaning evidence that proved that she was within her restrictions and gave her a ticket anyway uh, so it'll have to be settled out in court but that's just part of dealing with our um, <clears throat> our police state and uh, what's going on. If he saw she was not drunk, he should have let her go, and he could have easily verified whether she had an office in St. Cloud or not. Uh, so it's, uh, she's got to deal with that, but that's our court system. That's our legal system. That's how it works, and part of the deal, and everybody is sucked into that. And if a person thinks that those things are a disqualifier to be on the Supreme Court, to be falsely accused, uh, to be uh, ticketed falsely, or even, uh, it, it's just not, uh, and shouldn't be. You have to look at other issues. But that's just an update on uh, Michelle McDonald. I'm still thoroughly behind her for the Supreme Court. I think she's well more qualified. and. And the information on Judge Lily Hogg, uh, we're gathering it. We'll have it on a show here coming up. But his activities with Fast and Furious, the illegal gun sales to criminals in Mexico, um, that's uh, not being exposed properly. Uh, it has been talked about extensively, but he has a tie in with that. Uh, also, a horrendous decision he made in State versus Nelson was basically said, and my interpretation of the case is that uh, fathers are just a money pit. Uh, that's all they are to the children. Care and support means just money. Doesn't mean that you're actively involved in your child's life. Uh, it just means money. And of course the majority in the Minnesota Supreme Court said no, care and support goes beyond just money. Uh, it goes to the aspect of how you're involved in your kids' lives. Uh, whether you're let to be involved in your kid's life and to the extent that you are allowed to be involved in kid's life, you're doing what you can do uh, to be there. And uh, Judge Justice Lily Hogg said, nah, it's just money. If you're not paying everything that you owe, whether you have the money or not, we're going to incarcerate you, even though you're fully engaged in your children's life, uh, which is sad, sad mentality. It goes to the state of his mind his ability to make judgments so anyway that will be coming out in another show more details on that uh, Michelle McDonald wrote an amicus brief in favor of Nelson saying fathers are more than just money 
and laid out a wonderful brief, uh, well written, the best I've seen written on this issue. And uh, so uh, hopefully Minnesota is starting to change their attitude towards fathers. But this does get into domestic violence uh, because the law can be used as a weapon of violence, uh, not, not domestic, but violence itself. And um, everybody has to deal with domestic violence. Everybody has to deal with violence, whether it's words, whether it's civil actions. False allegations are violent. Uh, they go to the core of an individual and really, really shake them up. And um, false allegations is just as needs, just as importantly to be dealt with. Uh, and false information and lying, it, it all needs to be dealt with because it is violence. And um, it's very hard to deal with in our society because of individual personal motives or politics uh, gets overlooking, overlooked, <laughs> overlooking, overlooked. And we're, we're really uh, not going to be able to change the issue of domestic violence and deal with domestic violence and the view towards fathers. Um, it, that change won't happen until somebody like Michelle McDonald gets on the court to help change and to help expose what's going on in the judiciary. And believe me, a Supreme Court justice has a lot to say regarding the rules, uh, the transparency of the Supreme Court and, and, and the court system. And it'd be nice to have one, one person on the Supreme Court that has that attitude and mindset. One person would not hurt anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then the debate would begin and be out in public and we can really expose and lift everybody up rather than right now we're in a scenario really trying to push people down or just raise some people and not others. And, then, and unfortunately right now uh, the whole goal is to raise women above men and um, it shouldn't be either. It shouldn't be men above women or women above men. They all need to be, everybody needs to be respected as they are as an individual. All right, but you look at their behavior and what they're doing because behavior is everything. All the laws we have on restrictions are about behavior. Things you do, things you say are out of behavior. All right, so let's start this with uh, what's happening in Minnesota and the abuse that's taking place in Planned Parenthood. And liveaction.org uh, does a lot of undercover investigative research on um, the Planned Parenthood, the abortion mills, and the type of counseling that goes on in there. And recently, Live Action, in my understanding just yesterday, came out, um, actually made the O'Reilly factor, uh, but came out with a video clip about what has taken place in, it was an undercover investigation in Eden Prairie. We're going to show you the video of that, the toned down video, but still it is graphic. It's not meant for children. And so turn the show off if you don't want your children to see this uh, because it's graphic information. But on, on the other hand, it's what's being taught in many of our public schools uh, through the Common Core curriculum uh, that's being implemented. So your kids are getting this anyway, but parents, I advise you, you look at it first, then you decide whether you want to show your kids. I don't think they need to see this, but that's your call. And uh, you can change the channel. This video runs 7 minutes, 17 seconds. So uh, if you don't want to watch, see you back in about eight minutes. All right, let's play the video. and your response to pain, things like whips and nipple clamps. You can get a horse whip with oh, wow. like welts across the back.
wouldn't say abuse because it's consensual. If he wants to try something that's physical that is going to cause you harm or pain and you're okay with that, that's a completely different thing than if he wants to try something to do that you're not okay with. Patients will sometimes come in with rope burns or um, markings on their breasts from like clamps. Oh, okay. And again, okay. if it's consensual, mm -hmm. it's, okay. it's okay. If you're both consenting to it, it's something that's happening behind closed doors, it's okay. Anything within the sexual world is normal as long as it's consensual. Can I just ask you quickly how old you are? I'm 15. Okay. He kind of threw out that he wanted to try um, try some new things. Okay. Um, he threw out like role play. Okay. And uh, it sounded like a funny idea, but I, I guess like I, I just don't really know if that's like normal. Role play absolutely is normal. Um, it's, I would say anything within the sexual world is normal as long as it's consensual between okay. two people. He threw out a book called, um, Called Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay. Uh huh. All right. So, okay. Have you read that book? No. Has he? I'm not sure. Okay. Actually. Um. I think that's interesting. So. Okay. Why? Um. So there are lots of things that happen in Fifty Shades of Grey that border on. Um, I wouldn't say abuse because it's consensual but definitely extreme. So there are things that happen extreme. in Fifty Shades of Grey that are extreme. Now, if it's consensual, again, completely normal. Um, uh, things that happen in Fifty Shades of Grey all center around pain and your response to pain and submission. I'm not gonna say whether it's right or wrong. I thought it was a good book, but whether the behavior itself is right or wrong, I don't know. Um, my focus really would be on your safety mm -hmm. and just that it's consensual. Those are, again, the two pieces that I would mm -hmm. say are the most important part. Mm -hmm. So if he wants to try something that's physical that is going to cause you harm or pain and you're okay with that, that's a completely different thing than if he wants to try something to do that you're not okay with or that you feel okay pressured to. Okay. 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 Role play to the extreme of submissive, submissive um, behavior. Um, it's pretty extreme. I, at the age of 16, I don't know that it's something that I would recommend. Um, but I guess if you're both of the same age with the same expectations, then I think that's okay. It's okay. I would be really open and ask him, what is it that you think you want to do? Mm -hmm. And what are you asking me? Items that are used in Fifty Shades would be things like whips and nipple clamps and, um, I, I don't know, it's been a while, but and there are lots of physical things in there. And again, a lot of them focus mm -hmm. around pain. So I would just be frank with him and say, what exactly mm -hmm. is it that you're suggesting we try? I'm mm -hmm. open to it, but I just want to know what it is you mean so that we're on the same page. Do people actually use uh, the whips or are they more like props? No, they're like <laughs> You like actually whips. use them? Oh, like wow. Welts across the back. What? Why? Um, like what's... How does <laughs> that work? Do that? <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> yeah. Um, again, you're getting into kind of a realm of a sexual world where it's personal preference. Okay. Um, and as long as it's consensual, it's okay. It's but okay. there are, like I said, there are people, there are thoughts that that's borderline of okay behavior. Um, and I, I look at it and I say, if you're both consenting to it, it's something that's happening behind closed doors, that's okay. If it's something that you're thinking about, I would read the book. Read the if book? He, if he says to you, I read the book, mm -hmm. or I've heard about the book, and there were some ideas in there that I'd like to try, mm -hmm then I would say read the book read so the book. that you know what he's referring to because okay. otherwise you're not on the same ground. Okay. So if it does turn out that like, I mean, what he's thinking is along like the, the whips mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, you know, I, I'm okay with like experimenting or whatever. Um, do you think it's okay if we try that? Like there's nothing wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with trying it. No. Okay. Um, but if you try it and didn't like it right. or if you're trying it and you say stop, then there needs to okay. be that communication. Okay. Um, there are definitely stores. Um, 
just across the street here. Mm. It's kind of like a higher end boutique. Other places you might have think of or heard of would be like those okay. kinds of places are going to sell sex toys, sex props, those kinds of things. Okay. Um, they exist. It's not illegal. It's not, <laughs> not, you know, okay. Is it normal in a 16-year-old's relationship? I would say it's unusual for people to tell me about it. But I don't know that it's not normal, no. that it's not happening. Okay. Are you on any form of birth control? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you feel like you're having safe sex mm -hmm. in that regard? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. All right. And okay. I think it's going to just depend on what it is that you're looking He's for. Looking. Okay. You know, um, I mean, you can get a horse whip. I wouldn't recommend it, but I'm sure you can. <laughs> so, I mean, it just kind of depends on what you guys are looking for. Okay. There are probably a lot okay. of things out there that I don't even know about. Okay. Um, I know, uh, for example, patients will sometimes come in with rope burns or um, markings on their breasts from, like, clamps. Oh, okay. And okay. again, if it's consensual. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's okay. Um, there are things like, um, they call them, and, I mean, there are all kinds of anal play. Those kind of fall more into the category of, of sex toys, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, again, all normal as long as it's consensual. Okay. If it's just two kids that go to school together that are, well, relatively mm -hmm. <laughs> But, uh, you know, if you're on equal ground and you're both consenting to the behavior that you're doing, then that's okay. So there's other clips, PlannedParenthoodExposed.com, uh, that you have to get uh, permission to get on that website. But interesting, this is a 15-year-old, uh, still a minor, that... Um, Planned Parenthood was giving advice to, wasn't concerned about the age of the uh, man uh, who was uh, having sexual relationships with her and giving out this type of advice that should be left to uh, a parent. Um, th this, is, this is your Planned Parenthood in Minnesota. This is outrageous and your parents should be upset, your taxpayer should be upset that your money is funding uh, this type of uh, counseling, uh, this type of abuse. It's okay to be abused if you want to be abused. And no, we don't, we don't do that uh, here. That's not right. Uh, that's why we have things like statutory rape, uh, because the kids don't know. They don't know how bad this is, how detrimental it is to them over the rest of their life, and how it will destroy their uh, emotional, psychological uh, well-being and, and their soul. Uh, and uh, that's why we do have, uh, all our laws have a moral content to them. In every legislature, whenever they're arguing for or against a law, is arguing based on a moral, uh, a morality that they uh, have. And um, not only is it the physical activity that's abusive in the suggestions, but it's also the information that's given is abusive. And that's why we're going to show this next clip uh, from the National Pro Life Alliance where it's asking you to support a, um, uh, a federal bill that would have everybody who's seeking an abortion see a, uh, I just forgot the word, ultrasound, see an ultrasound of the child because it is a child, where there are many, many, well, the, Planned Parenthood doesn't want that to take place because they know, and the studies are, that 90 percent, and in Minnesota it's around 94 percent of the women that see this video, all of a sudden the light goes on, this is a baby, this is a human, this is a life, I'm not going to have the abortion. 94 percent. And so they've been so trained to be deceived uh, by the media, by Planned Parenthood, by the conversation in the legislature that it's not a life, that's just a blob of tissue, 
Uh, it, it doesn't have a heartbeat. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't have arms and legs, which it does. And when they see that, they go, wait, you know, the light comes on. And just like to, um, it's interesting here that there's a strong attempt uh, and in some places, trained psychologists cannot talk to patients about therapies uh, for coming out of the gay lifestyle. But this is, an this is an untrained person is allowed to talk about, Even though abortion is about these uh, sexual therapies. And this is abuse. And um, it's, it's a verbal abuse of misinformation and lies about sexuality and about what's healthy for an individual throughout the rest of their life. So let's look at this National Pro-Life Alliance video, and I'm, I'm going to warn you. Uh, it will show a baby in, in utero. Uh, uh, it will show the human being still in a woman that's pregnant. Abortionists already do sonograms to perform an abortion. Abortion defenders say that the possibility that the patient can see the sonogram is bad for women. But what they really mean is that it's bad for the abortion business. Rabbit abortion proponents claim that the... Oh. If you can't see it's a baby, you're just blind. Studies show that as many as 90% of the women who see a sonogram of their unborn baby reject abortion and choose life. That is why National Pro-Life Alliance members continue to work both at the state and national level to pass ultrasound laws. Even though abortionists already do sonograms to perform an abortion, Abortion defenders say that the possibility that the patient can see the sonogram is bad for women. But what they really mean is that it's bad for the abortion business. Rabbit abortion proponents claim that the clear proof of life in the womb should make no difference. Allison Benedict, an editor at Slate Magazine, complains that the opportunity for parents to now see their baby's gender is making them squeamish about aborting, saying, No matter how many ultrasound pics get posted to Facebook, these are fetuses. Go for a second if you must, then get over it. With strong grassroots support from National Pro-Life Alliance members and other pro-lifers, 15 states have already passed laws requiring abortionists to show women ultrasound images of their unborn babies before performing abortions, and seven more states are looking to pass laws. Unfortunately, unborn babies and their mothers are out of luck in states where the abortion lobby still holds a death grip. So in addition to fighting for more and stronger state laws, National Pro-Life Alliance members are taking the fight to the federal level in support of the Ultrasound Informed Consent Act, H.R. 3805. Please tell your congressman to immediately co-sponsor and act on the Ultrasound Informed Consent Act by signing the petition below. And if you are able, please chip in with a donation after signing to help us carry on this fight. A personal sonogram is something I believe all mothers need to see. But most important, they save babies' lives, which is why we must do all we can to pass ultrasound laws. As you can see, ultrasound technology can soften even the most hardened hearts. So in addition to lobbying the politicians in your state, please help us push for the Ultrasound Informed Consent Act by signing the petition below, because nothing in Congress moves unless we push it. And if you can, please chip in with a donation, perhaps $25, $50, or even $100, to help the National Pro-Life Alliance expand our mobilization program to contact more pro-lifers across the country. All right, uh, as they would say, the abortion doctors, the abortion industry, gulp and get over it. Sure, it looks like a human being, so what? Get over it. Um, and actually, uh, we've played clips of an abortion doctor uh, who, who would say how they would sell abortions. Um, and of course, one was it's just a, a glob of tissue. And when a test came up for pregnancy, pregnancy came up negative, in other words, you're not pregnant, they would tell the woman, you know, these tests are often false, do you want to make sure? And so let's go ahead with the procedure. And then in order to justify that, which is illegal, they would scrape tissue off the uterus and uh, show these blob of uterine tissue and say that was your baby. Uh, that's abuse. Uh, the lies are violence, and as long as women, Planned Parenthood and the feminazis and the DFL women 
uh, continue with this lie, and, and, and there's some Republican women, not many, uh, but there's some that want to continue with this lie. As long as they continue, they don't care about women or domestic violence. They couldn't care less. It's all about the money and the political agenda that's being established, which is, which is more of a socialistic, communistic uh, overthrow of, the, of, of our government. So that's, it's tragic. But that doctor is going to be in town here uh, in a couple months, and I'm working on getting a, an interview, having her on the show, or doing an interview with her uh, so that you can hear. Of course, she's on a number of, in a number of movies describing what she did uh, and what the abortion industry does. So it's readily available for anybody to find out. Uh, but you're going to want to see it. Um, so hopefully I can have her on. But here's, here's the thing. We're talking about domestic violence. And this all ties in because now you're going to hear a U.S. Senate hearing on domestic violence and uh, stopping domestic violence, uh, especially in the use of guns. And so the Senate is looking at and having a preliminary hearing. They don't have the support. They, don't know, they know they don't have the support on this issue because what it's really doing is taking away constitutional rights. And that's the problem they're having. They're saying they're having a problem of, of, about not people agreeing on stopping domestic violence. Well, yes, we're not agreeing on how to stop it, but everyone agrees domestic violence needs to be stopped, needs to be dealt with, but they're doing it with an unconstitutional way that takes away liberties and lets false allegations win the day. That's their goal and their emphasis. And it's not about stopping domestic violence, it's about taking away liberties that you have that are unalienable without due process. That's what it's about, and that's why they can't move forward. And Senator Klobuchar, this is her bill. This is her key aspect. And so she's the one, in my opinion, that is hurting and stopping the, uh, the ending of domestic violence against women or criminalizing it in such a way that's more effective. And because she's just focusing on women and not men, domestic violence will never, in my opinion, be dealt with properly and have a, and have a fair hearing and be dealt with rightly. And Senator Klobuchar can do the right thing. She chooses to do the wrong thing, in my opinion. So we're going to start here with Dr. Joyce Malcolm making a presentation on the problems with uh, the domestic violence bill that's being proposed in the Senate. So let's hear what Dr. Joyce Malcolm has to say. Dr. Malcolm. Yes, uh, first I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me. It's a real honor to uh, be present uh, at this important hearing. Um, I think that we can all agree that we have the same goals here, that we want to protect victims of domestic violence and more generally int we're interested in public safety. Uh, the current laws on the books are not perfect, but they have the great virtue of according with long-standing traditions of American law by protecting the rights of everyone concerned, rights that the Supreme Court defines as deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty. And with due respect to Chairman Whitehouse, these bills that uh, are behind this hearing uh, do do violence to the right of the Second Amendment, uh, Fourth Amendment rights against unreasonable search and seizure, and most importantly, I think, to due process, uh, providing due process in the normal way. Um, I'd like to first start with uh, some statistics to put this whole debate in context. Um, a, a fact that is very seldom um, advertised is that homicides in this country have been down sharply for the last 20 years, uh, as well as other violent crime. The last time that the crime rate for serious crime, murder, rape, robbery, and assault, was this low, gasoline was 29 cents a gallon. And the average American uh, working person was earning $5,807. Uh, it's hard for us to remember gas at 29 cents a gallon. <laughs> Um, the rate of family violence, which is much more the focus of this hearing, has also fallen uh, between 1993 and 2002 and has continues to fall. Only one in ten violent victimizations uh, involve family violence. 
and most family violence is simple assault. Less than one half of one percent of the victims are killed. The um, proportion of female homicides during this time period of people who are women who are killed by guns is also down, while women who have been killed by other means has gone up. The Blumenthal and Klobuchar bills present various problems for the um, right of individuals to keep and bear arms for the protection against unreasonable search and seizure and due process. Um, there's this new focus on stalking, uh, expanding to non-cohabiting individuals, um, and involving not only um, serious uh, incidents of, of actual violence, but bullying, a wide range of other acts uh, under the definition of harassment, which can be verbal and very vague, and seems to uh, often tend to grow, um, depending on what you regard as harassment. Large numbers of people uh, who are likely to be convicted or might be convicted of simply verbally harassing somebody might lose the right to have a firearm. The most concerning thing, I think, is that these, the change in the temporary restraining order. The temporary restraining order would mean that the person who is alleging that they um, are endangered, after they file for this, after their mere allegation, can send the police to the person that they are citing home searching for guns or any other weapon that they find without any kind of a hearing. In other words, as the um, Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland said, it's sentence first and verdict afterwards. And that is a true violation of the right of everyone to be heard. And in fact, in um, temporary restraining order hearings in the past, um, half of those who have been cited as being potentially dangerous have been found not guilty. But all of these people would, in the future, have their weapons taken away from them first, and then we would, you know, sometime later, there would be a hearing at which they would be allowed to um, produce some kind of evidence to the contrary. The other aspect that is troubling is making this retroactive so that anyone who is ever convicted of uh, um, harassment or uh, had a temporary restraining order against them would lose their right to be armed indefinitely. Uh, many people who have accepted plea bargains on the assumption that they knew what that entailed would find that they now are no longer have a right to be armed for the rest of their lives. I think that the, the intention is there to do good and to protect women, um, but I think that both of these bills have the wrong approach. It's wrong to deprive people of their basic rights. It's wrong to deprive people of the right of due process and opportunity to present evidence before um, they are actually you know, treated as if they were guilty and afterwards things are sorted out. Um, I would like to just conclude with um, uh, the, um, the majority opinion uh, written by Justice Scalia and Heller where he ends by saying, the enshrinement of constitutional rights necessarily takes certain policy choices off the table. I think there are other and better ways that women can be protected without having to violate their rights or the right, uh, excuse me, the rights of anyone you know, in the process. Thank you. Now, do you think that this lady here, I mean, she sounds sensible. She sounds, let's deal with the issue, let's deal with it the right way, let's not take away anybody's rights, and, and let's be fair about this. And that's a sensible approach. I don't get that from the domestic violence industry. If we're going to hang the guy uh, ignoring the abuse of women, or that women abuse, and who cares about their rights? Our allegation is enough. And you've heard her say that when these things go to court, half of them are thrown out, okay? Which is a problem because of perjury. Is perjury being given? And, and if it is, and if it's proven, what's being done about the perjury? And of course, you have Senator Marco Rubio saying, who cares about false allegations? We're not gonna deal with that issue. Well, it destroys a life. 
and false allegations take away somebody's liberty and it takes away their rights, their constitutional rights. Uh, that's how it can happen. And the big thing that was not talked about this in the hearing, but they talked about the difference between a warrant and a, well, they didn't talk about the difference between a warrant and a restraining order uh, or an order for protection. Um, they said, the, this one of the senators leading this said it, they're the same thing. You know, they're, they're based on the same basis. And the answer is no, they're not based on the same basis because a, a warrant is in the criminal activity. Uh, order for protection is in the civil arena. And you don't have the same rules of evidence. One, uh, you have to have sworn testimony and it has to be presented to a judge. And in this case, uh, you're gonna hear in the next clip uh, a lady talking about the difference, but she's not telling the truth uh, in, the, in that story. She's not, set, not letting people know that there is no hearing. She says there's a hearing. There is no hearing to get the ex parte restraining order. It is on the woman's testimony. That woman doesn't even see a judge. She fills out a paper. There's magic words to use. You use those magic words. The judge signs the paper that, that uh, uh, alleged abusing partner is out of the house. There may be a real abuse going on, but the alleged is out of the house. They're away from the children, and it they actually have anywhere from a month to six weeks before they get back into court. It's a long time to not see your kids. Safety is an issue. I think they just need, I need to think they need to make this criminal. If you're going to get a restraining order, you need to use criminal laws, not civil laws, uh, to get that done and have a higher threshold. Um, and it, it won't be that difficult to do, and it shouldn't be that difficult to do. But uh, most people, because these are civil, you, you don't even get a you don't get a, an attorney. You have no right to attorney, and your constitutional rights are being taken away, and you have no right to an attorney. That's our domestic violence laws, and that is bad. It is wrong, and it's immoral, uh, and it needs to stop. So let's watch this next clip here as they talk about this aspect. It's a back, a back and forth with uh, Senator Durbin and uh, Dr. Malcolm and one other witness there. Let's watch this. Professor Malcolm, do you believe that victims of domestic abuse are safer if their abusers are permitted to carry guns while they're the subject of temporary restraining orders? You have to turn your microphone on. Sorry. Um, I think that to know that that person actually is an abuser, he's entitled, and I'm assuming it's a he, he's entitled to have a hearing first before his gun any, or any other weapon is taken away. Doesn't the issuance of a temporary restraining order suggest in most cases a hearing? It does, but not in these bills. They get the, they are able to accuse the person, their guns or weapons are taken away, and then they have the hearing. But in these bills, we're talking about convicted stalkers, convicted uh, domestic uh, violence perpetrators, and those who are subject in the Blumenthal bill to a temporary restraining order. In each of those cases, aren't we talking about a court hearing before that determination? We have been in the past. I think that this law would change it so that the, in order to protect the woman, there is this opportunity to make the allegation that guns get taken away and then they have the hearing. There's no question that there can be ex parte hearings because in some instances the person who's the subject of the order won't appear. That's a reality. I've been through that it, many years ago when I practiced law. So are we in a situation now where a woman terrorized by a boyfriend or former spouse is at his mercy as long as he refuses to come to court by your analysis? No, I think once you agree to hold the hearing, if he doesn't show up, then that, that at least you've given him the opportunity to be heard. So I think that that, that provides, you know, a, a fair uh, chance for um, the evidence to come out on both sides. And and that's the, a concern. And once the temporary restraining order is issued to protect the woman, like we're using case of woman here, to protect the woman from the stalker, the abuser, the person who's perpetrating domestic violence, once that's issued, do you still quarrel with the notion that we should, at that point, take the gun away from that person? 
No, I think that once there's been, you know, a fair hearing and evidence has been presented, um, then if this person does seem to be really posing a threat, I think that that's fair. I'd like to ask um, Dr. Campbell what you think about this argument of the course of hearings and such while we're dealing with perhaps a woman who has been terrorized or has evidence of abuse to present to the court? In order to obtain a temporary order of protection or an emergency order, they're sometimes called in some states, there is a hearing. A judge has to issue that temporary order. Um, the, the permanent or long-term orders are, there's a, a fuller hearing, and that's when perpetrators have the opportunity to appear. I've been through this. Anyone who's had a domestic practice has gotten the phone call. You know, I'm, I'm scared of this guy. I'm, it doesn't happen often, thank goodness. It wasn't in my practice, but it does happen. The first instinct of a lawyer the first instinct of most persons, protect the person who's being threatened. Argue it out in court later on, but first, protect the person who's being threatened, the children who are being threatened. I think that's the premise of this whole discussion. Right, and a, and a judge does have to issue that. A judge, like we've heard here, who is concerned uh, with a level playing field um, in issuing that order, so wants to hear evidence uh, before that temporary order is issued. Okay, wants to hear evidence before that temporary order is issued. Doesn't happen in Minnesota. It's a piece of paper. <clears throat> um, an ex parte order, boom, done right, right now. Uh, a hearing, you can get a hearing pretty quick, uh, but this is what Senator Durbin was doing in this questioning, was going back to the base. We want to protect people who are abused. Nobody is questioning that. I don't know who is. So he goes to the base to justify violating constitutional rights. And uh, is there more that could be done? Yes, and I think the best thing that can be done is by having stronger hearings, uh, people having lawyers, uh, actually having evidence, um, having the understanding that women abuse just as much and just as often as men. And I believe uh, if Joyce uh, Malcolm would have been able to testify on that, would have testified that way. She's done research. Uh, she knows what's going on. And it the, the issue they're trying to, this is what Senator Durbin was doing. He would say, convicted stalkers. Well, yes, those that have been through a trial and have had their liberties taken, uh, yes. I mean, because they've been convicted by a jury. That's the way you can re remove constitutional protections, being convicted by a jury of your peers. That's the way it can happen. But that's the way it is now. But they're also in this bill is saying, now we're going to go back to those uh, who many men, because men are charged, look at this and their wives go to them, just take the temporary order or the order for protection and let's work on this and use it as a weapon and they go, okay, I'll do that. Or, you know, I'm not abusing anyway, so I'm just going to let this one go. Okay, I'll just admit to it, let it go, and, you know, we'll work this out. Now they're going to go back to that individual who agreed to uh, a restraining order or order for protection and say, no, now you lose your constitutional rights. And you didn't, because the laws were different then, you can't change your order. And this is what we're talking about with the 50-year uh, uh, restraining order, the James Bergstrom, who won his... Uh, case, or I shouldn't say it wasn't in court, but settled, uh, where the laws changed on him. And now he's having to face a, a lot longer time away from his kids. And he accepted restraining orders because that's what his wife demanded. Otherwise, she was going to uh, divorce him. And he accepted these when the laws were different, 
and now she's using the new laws against him and are being used against him, and now he wants to go back, and I believe he's going to go back and reopen his cases and said, I'm going to change my uh, uh, no contest plea to not guilty because these laws changed. And he has to do it in order to see his kids. Uh, and that's what we're going to get, and that's what the Senate is talking about doing here, is, deny, is, is adding laws to people who have already been convicted, and that is ex post facto. Of course, the courts have gone and said ex post facto is, uh, doesn't apply in a number of situations, and uh, uh, it just really messes people <laughs> over big time. So... Okay, the domestic violence industry, and I think this hearing by Senator Klobuchar is violence in itself because Senator Klobuchar is not going to deal with the real issues that are going on. She's not going to deal with the false allegations. They want to supersede the Constitution so people's rights are taken away. That's your Senator Klobuchar, and that needs to stop. Uh, and she should be held accountable. I don't think she's a good senator. Uh, she's so politically motivated, and especially in this domestic violence industry and in a feminist extreme, uh, that men she doesn't care about. And, of course, I don't care about men who have been convicted and are abusing women either. I care about them in the sense where their soul and what's happening to them and their just own self-destruction, and they need to be taken out of society and locked up. Um, but that's not what we're dealing with here, and that's not what we're caring about. And so uh, I want to bring this domestic violence back full circle, and I hope I can do it here in the short amount of time. Uh, but Tom James, who wrote the book uh, Domestic Violence, The 12 Things You Aren't Supposed to Know, which some of the issues... Uh, uh, the doctor there, Joyce Malcolm, covered is uh, violence is down in the gun area and in other ways it's up, but domestic violence against women is way down and domestic violence against men is way up. Uh, uh, would agree with that. He wrote a message uh, about the um, Robin Williams suicide. I think I thought it was poignant. Um, and, and I'm just going to have to take pieces out of this but uh, to, to give you the picture because we're almost out of time here. Scrolling through Facebook messages today, I see a big debate has begun over what made Robin Williams do what he did. Some say it was divorce slash financial difficulties. Others say it was mental illness. The ones in the latter camp strenuously deny that it had anything to do with the divorce Astro astronomically high alimony obligations or other financial problems because he had a history of depression and self-medicating as if depression, divorce, and financial difficulties cannot be interrelated. People who engage in this kind of debate are deeply invested in winning some ridiculous chicken versus egg contest for reasons only they can know. They really couldn't care less about what drove Robin Williams to do what he did. Of course, and Robin Williams' weapon of choice was a belt. Uh, it goes around your waist. Um, it was not a gun. Um, Soren Kierkegaard wrote, Once you label me, you negate me. That's what people are trying to do with this news story. Make it go away by bracketing off with labels. He was mentally ill. Well, that's that. Now I can get back to the business of increasing my acquisitions and journalist Paul Ellum is a notable, if not the only exception to the rule. For that reason, I think this article is worthy of reprinting. I used to think the worst thing in life was to end up all alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is ending up with people who make you feel all alone. And that was Robin Williams' last Clayton's World's Greatest Dad. And uh, ABC News printed the ex Breast wishes of the family to be left alone while they're reeling from the shock. On the same page, ABC offered readers a live cam aerial view of Williams' homes. Fox News' Shepard Smith referred to Williams in the words, such a coward, then offered a quick retraction and apology as he realized public grief turned to outrage and would be aimed directly between his mascara-caked eyes. 
Different strokes actor Todd Bridges tweeted, how selfish. Williams was then later issued the same uh, CYA apologies. Other coverage of this tragedy has been somewhat more thoughtful, but most are comprised of homages to his brilliant work as a comic and actor. Okay. Um, the circumstances which led, which appear to have led actually to a suicide have been referenced in some places, but have otherwise been left unexamined. So far, no one in mainstream media is looking at the life of Rob, Robin Williams even, and even those trying to connect the dots on what led to the contemporary genius hanging dead at the end of a belt noose. In touching on the bare surface of the story, the media has managed to place in places to utter the words divorce and financial problems. Getting any deeper, however, remains typically out of the question for mainstream coverage. Journalists are noting that his relapse back into drinking helped lead to a second divorce. No one is questioning whether a second marriage helped lead to his relapse. I won't speculate that this is the case, though I think it's unfair to wonder. I think a lot of questions could and should be asked about how we lost Robin Williams. Most of them won't be asked. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time, but here's the deal. Robin Williams and Mrs. Doubtfire laid it on the line. This was his personal pain that he humored with. And folks, um, it's domestic violence, and he talks about the divorce industry. He was in pain, and people don't realize the violence that the domestic violence industry, the divorce industry, creates itself. And um, we have to deal with that. So uh, later on, other shows. Got to go. God bless. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Right now, I see that you're long gone. Days go by. Sets on fire